What's it feel like to be an icon? There's no trans question. And I'm not a question. I exist here. Girl. <laughs> um, I mean, I sometimes have awareness of that. Like when people say something like that, I, you know, I think if you, if you are a person walking around every day, waking up saying I'm an icon, um, <laughs> it would be a problem. And I'm certainly not that person. And really for me, I'm just so grateful to be alive. I'm so grateful yeah. that I've gotten to work um, as an artist and that I've um, been able to use my voice in the way that I that I have. And so that's the gratitude that I get to continue to work and be an artist and that the work has inspired people and moved people. The icon thing is really for someone else. Because on at the end of the day, I mean, I'm so... I work really, really hard at what I do, yeah. and I'm always concerned about getting better at it. And yeah. that is what sort of motivates me with everything I do. And I'm really lucky. I was thinking about how many actors, um, a dear friend of mine who, um, Coleman Domingo, I will just say his name, because he is so talented. I've known Coleman for like 20 years, and he's working his ass off, and he's been incredibly talented for years and he is acting he was like i saw him a few weeks ago he was like i'm booked till next may or something yeah. just acting and i'm a busy girl but it's i i do a podcast and i host a red carpet and i do speaking engagements i do my music and acting is a is my first love and my biggest love but it's not yeah. what i do most um and part of that is you know i'm black i'm trans you know i'm 51 years old. There's just not that many parts for me, but I, I endure and I keep going and I keep working really, really hard at everything I do. And I treat, keep trying to get better. And that's what I'm more concerned with instead of like, I'm an icon because I think the icon thing is about laurels and sort of resting on what you've done and being acknowledged yeah. for that. And I'm interested in the next thing. I'm interested in like, what's but next? How do I get better? How do I get to the next level? And then um, just as an artist in terms of um, storytelling, what kind of power can I have in the industry? Because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I'm a worker. I'm still a worker. I'm not yeah. like a boss boss um, yet. And like, that's where the power is. And that's, you know, so these are the things that I, I think about. Um, but that's what makes you, that's what makes you iconic, Laverne. Like, I still remember the first time I seen you on Orange is the New Black. And it's mm -hmm. not even just that you are the first person I think of, or I think most people think of when we think of black trans women or women in entertainment and media. It's not just that, but I remember seeing you for the first time and being like, she is acting down. I am weeping. Like, loved you from time. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny. When the minute I, I call my... This is a collaboration. I have like 20 questions that my friends who all love oh you have curated God. to ask you, child. I, oh my God, I, love we, it. I called it. I was like, you know what? I'm calling all my black gay friends and y'all about to tell me exactly what y'all want to hear. And the first thing my friend Philip said was, he said, she is such a light. And I was like, I know from the first time I seen her. And he's like, no, no, no. The first time I saw her was not Orange is the New Black. He said it was on an interview. And he's like, and all of her interviews, something that I always have noticed is that he said better than anybody else the bad faith questions, all of these narratives that they try to center around trans people that are not trans narratives. She does such an excellent job at pivoting that to legislation and the real issues. And that's, it's so much that makes you iconic. It's not just that you're an actress, not just that you're a singer. We have to talk about trip opera because me and my bestie definitely watched it drop and you are amazing. Uh, it's not just fashion, it's not just looks, but it's the way that you in a world where, especially as a black woman, period, let alone a trans black woman, there's so much hate and there's so much uh, push to mute yourself. You have so confidently carved out a lane. And I'm so like excited and want to know like who influenced that, how you got to the place to be 51 years old and be this woman that's so iconic to all of us. The, the how we frame narratives. So first of all, um, that I think that is dis dis. That is one of the things that, you know, makes me different from a lot of people that I have. I'm an actor and I do all these things, but then I can I can go into an interview situation and um and and break hopefully break it down and hopefully be nuanced, but also get be clear and um break the shit down. Break like yeah. what really matters down. So I 
I've learned from it. I've learned from experience. Um, years before Orange is the New Black, I, I did a reality show in 2008 called I'm Gonna Work for Diddy. And then I started, I used the little platform I got from there to really advocate. And I was, and so I've been an activist. I've been going to Equality and Justice Days in Albany, trying to, you know, get the get gender passed for years and writing yeah. um, um, trans pieces for the Huffington Post and, and going to protest and, and being involved. Um, a new movie came out called. Um, um, the Stroll that my friend Zachary Drucker um, directed. And there is a photo from me in like 2001 when we were trying to get the um, human rights um, uh, law in New York City um, uh, changed to include trans people. And I was there testifying. And I, you know, it was one of the things I kind of, you know, forgot about. And there's like documentation of me there. There's a photo. And I'm just like, you know, so I've been doing this for a while. Yeah. And so and kind of sort of figuring out how to navigate media. And um, yeah, when I, when, when Orange happened too, I, I knew, all I knew when that show came out, because Netflix was in a completely different place than it is now. So I, you know, House of Cards had come out. I didn't, I thought I was doing a web series. And I was 40 years old when I booked that part. So I was like, I don't know how long this is going to last. So I need to try to build a brand for myself um, and also change the conversation with and about trans people. Uh, yeah. So if it was an activist um, um, mentality in relationship to how we're talked with and about in the media that I thought was crucial, that was be bigger than me. But it was also like, how do I, I there, there can't be space created for me with this old conversation. We yeah. cannot have a space for me and other trans people with the ways that they've been talking about with and about trans people up exactly. until that point. It was 2014 when things really started to change. And we're in an interesting point now. You know, I was on the cover of Time Magazine in 2014 and called the transgender tipping point. And nine years later, you know, for trans people, it is, um, it's dire. It really is yeah. dire. And what I, what I whew, I'm just taking a breath because I just, um, it's going to be all over the place, but I just got back from Savannah, Georgia, and I was shooting a show that I'm the lead of, that I co-created, executive produced. Um, it's the first scripted um, show that I've um, um, created, um, and it's been a, a dream 15 years in the making. It's a miracle mm -hmm. that that show got produced. Um, Amazon Freebie is doing it because a lot of trans led projects are dying in development right. right now. So there's there's something going on in Hollywood. Yes, we're more visible than we've ever been, but a lot of trans creators are finding that their um, projects aren't being bought, that they're um, stalling in development. Um, so all this, you know, sort of backlash against trans people is affecting, um, is yeah. affecting us in Hollywood too. And so, I, but I was also so grateful that I got to tell this story and got to be an artist. And I realized this week that I use it as a distraction from everything that's going on in the world with all this anti-trans yeah. legislation because it is devastating and i didn't you know and i and i i did i just posted something i did and um when the montana law passed um um back in january i was like okay i gotta i gotta go you know go out and like talk about this because they've been saying this is about the kids for years and then this the montana law banned gender from me here up to the age of 26. so i'm like I'm girl it's never been about the children and so and but i it takes so much out of me because yeah. I'm not just talking. This is my this is my life, and it's very right. emotional. And I don't know. Whew, and this is part of the way I haven't you know have, you haven't seen a lot of me talking about this. Yeah, because it is so. I love I love my community, and when I hear yeah. about young people and their parents having to flee states. Can you imagine like you, you're working class and you have to flee an entire state because you're, they're, they're banning your care or they want to criminalize your parents or your healthcare providers for giving you care or you just can't access any, yeah. and you have to flee a state? That's devastating. The suicide attempts that, that, that children are um, um, engaged in just when they hear about these, this is real life. And there is an yeah. attempted genocide against my community right now. And as a public public figure who, you know, who's been at this for a long time, it's just sort of like, I feel at a loss because yeah. this is just happening. And I've been, I've been on TV and I've been in DC and I've been at the Supreme Court and I've, you know, I've been places trying to like, 
elevate our humanity and tell people what's at stake for a very long time. And this is happening anyway. It's yeah. devastating. It is. And, it, and it's um, traumatizing. And, and so I'm trying to sort of be in my resilience with it and not fall apart and not feel hopeless. And, yeah. the, and, and what the, that, that's the piece, you know, cause I don't want, I don't want to go on uh, a platform and, and be hopeless and yeah. be, and be, de- and be just devastated because there's devastation, but what's the both and of it? It's also the resilience. It's like, how do we fight back? What do we, what can we do in this moment? How do we look to our ancestors and ancestors? What are folks doing right now? You know, um, the campaign for Southern equality is something I've been talking a lot about. I know, um, um, Alejandro talked about it um, on, on Leftist Mafia a few weeks ago. But the Campaign yeah. for Southern Equality is um, they're, they're providing grants um, to help people flee states or get access to care. And so this is what we as LGBTQ people, as people of color, have been, yeah. have been doing for centuries. This this yeah. idea of mutual aid, this idea of being there for each other in, in, in the most oppressive of circumstances. And so I'm like, this is how do we be there for each other. And then how, I mean, as much as we can, I think the context of what where we are now um, is that the right wing, right wing media, and when I say media, I say, I mean, social media, I mean, corporate media, um, I'm, some left center left leaning media has done a really good job of manufacturing consent that dehumanizes trans people, right? Yes. They've dehuman and then when you can successfully dehumanize people, you can take away their rights. And we're seeing this in real time. Right. Yeah. right. So much of what happened with um, black folks in slavery, they had to dehumanize us. Right. They had yeah. to say that we were less than that. We were animals so that they could justify enslaving yeah. us. We you know when what they were doing with um, um, immigrants at the border, you know, the dehumanizing. So we see all of this dehumanization and they've been so successful with trans people, partly because we're such a small part of the population. A lot of people don't know trans folks. And they the strategy was, I mean, they tried with bathrooms that failed. Yeah. But then when they started with the sports ban several years ago, well, people, because people really don't think trans women are women. So they were just yeah. like, well, that's not fair. And then they focused on children. And then that focus is obviously about banning care. You know, as Michael yeah. Knowles said, we want to eradicate transgenderism. So it's a it's a it's a genocide, and they've been so successful also because of the manufactured consent of the algorithms, the profit motive that that exists where people don't get any other information that pe- that you yeah. can exist and go through the world and just be fed your own confirmation bias or whatever in terms in social in terms of social media and nuance and the truth doesn't play uh, in the algorithm you know that facebook leaker gave us a few years ago gave us so much information that in fa- facebook's their internal research stated yeah. you know i mean this is i'm remembering this from a few years ago but stated that um, people stay on the platforms longer when there's conflict and yes. when there's conspiracy theories. For whatever reason, people stay on the platforms longer and they want to, you to stay on the platforms longer so they can sell ads yeah. and they can say people are on this and we can make money. And so, so much of the profit motive, the, the algorithm is not interested in nuance. The algorithm yeah. is not interested in love and empathy and the humanity of everybody. The algorithm yeah. responds to conflict, to conspiracy theories, to people at each other's throats. So there's so many factors that that have led to the moment that we're in right now. And we have to have a critical relationship to it. But how do we change the conversation? Yeah. And and changing the conversation is so crucial. And I I you know I I you know I'm a leftist mafia fan and I and I'm a um, surf time surf times fan. I love Lance. Yeah. And he's been such a wonderful advocate for for trans um folks and trans issues. But that whole Tim that whole Tim Pool debate, it's I'm like <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's not a debate because yeah. there's, I mean, the second we're in a situation where we're debating whether I should exist, you this opened is, it, the mistake are, is opening it to a debate. We're having the conversation on their terms. We yeah. have to change the conversation. It's not up for debate. For me, yeah. when, and, then, and, then, and, I, and there's a lot of people on the left who say, well, you know, access to gender affirming care for children, that is something we, no, 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 no. No, it's yeah. actually not it's not a conversation that yeah. we should be having. I said this before and I'll say it again. If you are the parent 
of a trans child or a healthcare professional, that's a conversation that you can have. Or you're a trans child yourself, yeah. that is a conversation you should have. But if you're not the parent of a trans child, a trans child yourself, or a healthcare provider, it's actually not your conversation to have because Absolutely. it's none of your business. It is none of your business what Absolutely. someone is doing with their bodies, whether they're a child or an adult. It's no, it's not up for yeah. it's, it's not up for public debate. It's about bodily autonomy. It's about freedom, and it is about the humanity. The humanity Absolutely. of folks. I believe this about uh, reproductive rights as well. It's nobody. With the second we start talking about fifteen weeks versus six weeks, but no, yeah. no, yeah. no, no. Yes. And I, you know, I'm trying to be. I try to be a respectable black woman and not get angry. You know, this is a, and this is hard. And so this is also why you don't see me a lot because I will. I'm 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 mad. I'm really yeah. really mad. And it's like no, six weeks, fifteen. No, the government should not be involved, period, in what's yeah. going on between me and my doctor in yeah. terms of reproductive rights, in terms of what happens to my body, period, point blank. And the second, the second we get into conversations about how many weeks, we're having the conversation on their terms. Yeah. We're having a conversation that is debating whether someone should have control over their bodies in every yeah. situation and have freedom in the United States of America. And so it is no, it's none of your business. It's not, up. Uh, it's my existence is not up for a debate. The trans question, trans, uh, trans ideology isn't even a thing. All of this language yeah. that they're using. I, we, I exist. I'm yeah. here. We've, always yeah. been here historically gender yeah. non-conforming folks have existed throughout history and it is a colonialist um idea yeah. western colonialist idea this whole idea of the gender binary we know that like third genders fourth genders non-binary pihidra two-spirit folks etc all over the yeah. world have existed i'm here we're here yeah. this is yeah. i'm not a question I, this is not up for debate that I exist yeah. and that we exist and that we have a right to be here. And so that for me is where where I need to start and where, where we need to like, how we need to reframe this. And one last thing I'll say about the conversation is that the culture war, this culture war, yes, that it's language it's is so, it's not a culture war. This is a human rights yeah. attack. This is because yeah. people just, it, it feels very dismissive. This culture that war. That is what it is. How is abortion a culture war issue? Exactly. It's meant and it's meant to do that, right? It's a straw man that they put up in place because if you call it the culture wars, then it immediately becomes a two sides of an issue rather than one side needs their rights and equality and another group of people oppose them having their rights and equality. And so they call it culture wars to dismiss that, you know, yeah. and it, listen to Neil Laverne. And this is something, you know, I realized because lifetime fan now. Um, and I watched the interview you did where someone someone said to you, you know, oh, your first role, they called Orange is the New Black your first role. And you're like, no, no, that's my breakout role to many people. But I had my first role in the 90s. And yeah. I think that's something important to remember is like, you are this advocate and you are this person. And it's because this is your lived experience. You don't get the opportunity. You're not playing a role. It's not, you don't get to just be an actress. You yeah. have to be, you know, an advocate. You have to speak around your issues. You have to support your community. And that's the reason why you're so excellent at pivoting and being able to show them like, no, 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 you're actually centering this narrative wrong. This should be about this. This should be this conversation. And that makes me think, you know, as a black woman in media spaces, how often you have to be in that room? Like how often do you get to be in a room where you're not being forced to field bad faith questions and, and um, said, avoid and circumvent these narratives? How often do you feel like you walk into media spaces, interview rooms, and you feel like you don't have to do that? I've been very blessed that I've been able to create a space and a lane for myself where I'm not always talking about trans um, issues. Yeah. And I've done that intentionally and I've done it, you know, just for branding, but also for my sanity. And there's yeah. so many other things that are interesting, I, I'd like to think, about me besides being, you know, a, a Black trans woman. I'm yeah. an artist and I'm committed to that work. And I, I love interior design and I love fashion and I love music and I and I love people and I love love and I love healing, being in this space of, of, of trying to heal. And, and um, that's so much the work too right now because the um, under estimating how traumatizing all of this is. Um, um, one of the, for the first season of my podcast, I interviewed Dr. Joy DeGru, um, yeah. who coined the term post-traumatic slave syndrome. And one of the most powerful things um, she said, two of the most powerful things that I, I call her saying on that podcast is that um, when, you know, 
folks who enslaved black folks and who people who were, you know, complicit in that, when they enslaved us, they weren't just dehumanizing us, they were dehumanizing themselves. Yeah. Right. And so where is the project of them rehumanizing? And then also yeah. after we were emancipated, where was the, you know, obviously it was, you know, 18, you know, 1865, you know, and then, like you know, then Juneteenth, you know, we we're just coming out of Juneteenth. A few years later for um, where, you know, we understood that we were free. And I say in quotes. Where was all the trauma therapy uh, for, yeah. g- for the generations of being enslaved and brutalized? Where was the the healing, you know, around and the yeah. trauma resilience work and just the the PTSD dealing with the PTSD of it all? And yeah. that is something that we're still, particularly in America, struggling with. I, I wonder for you, as someone from the Caribbean, if you feel that in the same way. I mean, obviously colonialism was global, but like, do you Absolutely. do you feel? You know, I always think it's. I always I think it. There's there's something interesting. This is a slight digression. There's something interesting about Black women, I think, who, particularly from Africa and the Caribbean specifically, or even that, that we, in terms of, I remember in, um, meeting Iman and interviewing her and looking at Naomi Campbell and Grace Jones. These are women I, I idolize and obs- am obsessed with. And none of them are from America. And they their sense of their worth is yeah. so in the core of them, that yeah. Iman, when it, and, and when, when she um, came to the states in the in the in the seventies, and they wanted to exoticize her, and they didn't want to pay her, there was just nothing in her constitution that was like any. N- this is acceptable. She was yeah. like, no, 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 I'm going to get paid what everybody else gets paid, and this is not an exotic thing. And and I, you know, and I speak seven languages, and I, you know, there was a sense yeah. of of. Um, they, they, you know, as Americans, I think we internalize, I, I think, I'll speak for myself, yeah. but, I, you know, for me as an American, someone born here, I internalize so much white supremacy, right? The colonization yeah. that happens that's so sort of instantaneous here. And I know colonialism is global, so we'll, we'll talk about your experience in the yeah. Caribbean, but I internalized so much racism that I had to unpack and, yeah. uh, and I had to work on my sense of worthiness that I feel a uh, Naomi Campbell and a, and a Mon and a Grace Jones, when you read Grace's biography, um, she just always knew who she yeah. was and, and felt a sense of, um, her power. Um, yeah. I, you, I mean, I, I mean, what do yeah. you think about that in terms of, in terms of your experience and around? So, so I have, um, so I grew up in the Bahamas, born and raised in the Bahamas. My daddy is Nigerian. And so the Bahamas is a very, very, I mean, the amount of it, Black majority, black majority country, black country, proud mm-hmm. black Bahamians. And you let any Bahamian sell, we are proud black people. But we were colonized and the and the internalization of that is hyper present in many respects. Obama is very colorist, very xenophobic, all these different yes. things. And so I had to bet, I will say this. My mom is, my mom is light, like light, light, light. But she is always hip to colorism as the most ignorant thing. And she she got in she got in front of it she got in front of it and my big sister my big sister thank god for her early vanity in life um made me the way that i am but my big sister was always like she came to us from front like y'all look gorgeous y'all look like me so any way y'all think it but they don't think she always kind of let me know beauty standards and this was dictated by other norms she was like she would just say y'all aren't in style yet you know these people think this because they believe light skin is this and certain hands Mm. and i was always under the impression that i look good they don't know it I'm top tier. They don't know it yet. And so then when I got to America and I came alone, so my family stayed in the Bahamas and they had no ability to tell me. And first I was in Florida, then West Virginia, then Ohio uh, before New York. And so I truly learned unraveled racism of realizing, wait a fucking minute. You know what I mean? Like, what is going on here? Like, a lot of people, you know, you hear all these stereotypes and all these things, but they're so foreign to you. You don't have any context for it. I'm like, what is going on? But you look around and you see how people are treating all of the black people, the few black people that are around you, how they're talking about them. And then you also recognize and something that, you know, makes you realize, and I'm going to talk to you about it, is respectability politics, I think, is one of the the greatest signs of colonization and the way we internalize it, both in the Caribbean and here. Because so much, so often people would say to me, even black people I know would make these stereotypes or comments to me based on aesthetic things that are so inconsistent with my background or my reality or my schooling but it's because we're married to these respectability politics and these ideas and i've i've always recognized the colonialism what i'm hearing is that the colonialism is different because you were in a majority black 
um, on, on majority black island country that that the um, and that your mother was hip to it, that your mother, because yeah. I think it's so I mean, so important if you know you're loved, you know, by your parents and you're told that you're beautiful and you feel that sense of, um, of unconditional love that can shift everything that, yeah. that will shift so much in terms of worthiness. Right. Yeah. Um, attachment theory, all the, all that stuff. So I think yeah. that's what I'm hearing. Do you, do you, yeah. would you agree? With yeah, that? absolutely. I, absolutely. I, and that's why I think look, something I've recognized is very often, and I think we all know it implicitly. It, it just, you know, the conversation stops short often in the black community because of where uh, black people are interested in having the conversation about LGBT rights. But in so many respects, we know, like it or not, we know when white people go and say something about racism is received much better than if we go say it, right? It's discredited yeah. from us. And in the same respect, the same is true for LGBTQ rights. Like the reality is, Lance could say something and that it could be, but because just by virtue of Lance being bi, just by, even though has a partner with women, all this, that would be discredited in a way that they will hear it more if they hear it from a cis woman or a straight person or what but it even is. even Lance going on Tim Pool's show, I, I, I'm i not interested in going on Tim Pool's show, but I don't know if Tim Pool would have me, you know? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. there, is, there, is, there is something about, and there's something wonderful about someone who looks yeah. like Lance with Lance's experience yeah. um, advocating for us. And it, it's a, Absolutely. It's a beautiful thing. Um, Absolutely. And we need that. Yeah. And I think, and that's what I, I, I want to have the conversation about, because I think so often you hear people like screaming, they, they both want to ignore and dismiss the trans community while also barking down at them that they're not explaining it to them right or bothering to educate them. Meanwhile, you're ignoring all of trans people anyway. And so something I wanted to ask was, how do we better show up? Like, what is it that <clears throat> you think are the most um, popular misconceptions or things that as cis people with a platform that they will listen to that we should be trying to say and what we should be trying to do with our platform? Well, I, I, you know, I love the video. You did a video. I don't remember when. Um, you did a video when you sort of talked about how all these things are connected, right? And yeah. I, and I like to remind people of that that they're not just coming when they, they're coming for trans rights and they're coming for reproductive rights. They're coming for yeah. civil. Rights, they're coming for all of it at the same time. And it's and what's amazing to me is the dexterity of the Republican Party and like the the ambidextrousness of the yeah. Republican Party. How many things they're doing at once and how organized and how much money there is. But I so I think. I love what you're doing. And I think a lot of it is about elevating the, I've always believed it's about elevating the voices and lived experiences of real trans folks. But then, um, so that's important. So that people can hear from us and experience our humanity and not just in the context of us talking about transness, but like just living our lives. A lot yeah. of what I'm trying to do right now is live my best life and do that publicly and be human in all the multiple ways that I am because I'm a human being. And so yeah. often that is stripped from us. And yeah. so elevating the humanity of trans people beyond our transness is so important. Um, the interconnectedness of it and then figuring and, 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 and how do we change the conversation? How do yeah. we take it back to the lived, you know, I'm all about data and all that stuff, but the lived experiences of what people are going through, what, what's yeah. happening to folks, the impact of this, what's really going on with people and how they're struggling is um, really important. And then how, or also how we're thriving, because it's not yeah. just a struggle, you know? Yeah. Um, but using your platform to, to platform other trans folks and other trans voices, I think it's, it's crucial having, and then also, and constantly being in a space of interrogating and holding ourselves accountable and interrogating our own positionalities. God, that feels like such a bell hooksian kind of uh, phrase, inter interrogating our own positionalities. Uh, yeah, I just tell like that sometimes. Um, <laughs> But but being self reflective and constantly like I have to in this mo in this moment of my life I have to be really critical of my privilege I have like this yeah. class privilege I've never had before and most of my community doesn't have this and the platform I have there's a, there's a considerable yeah. amount of privilege there so I have to be critical um, and self reflective as much as possible and hold myself accountable and allow myself to be held accountable too yeah. and I think that's the piece we don't. I, I, I still don't see enough of um, folks holding each other accountable in loving ways mm -hmm. and then that being received with the love and intention that was intended so that mm. people can transform. Yeah. That is not what I'm seeing. I, I um, the um, 
can't believe I'm getting into this mess. But the Anna Kasparian moment that happened yeah. uh, uh, on Twitter, and I'm a Young Turks fan, and I watch and critically. I watch yeah. everything critically, by the way. Yeah. I'm not, I don't consume any media. We yeah. cannot consume any media uncritically right now. Left, yeah. right, center, independent. We have to be critical of everything. But what was interesting to me about the Anna um, moment is how much um, Emma Emma Bigland from Majority Report specifically, and then and so many of the um, your panelists on the um, leftist mafia, extended grace to her and extended love and compassion and were attempting not to call her out, but to invite her in, right? Yeah. So this is what, this is how it should, be, should done, be doing it. I think. Yeah. I think this is how it should be done. And what was interesting is um, Anna's response. As <laughs> much as I, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan and I'm a fan, you know, but her response was not, commiserate with the love and the intent to bring her in and to for her to be self-reflective and it's it's interesting ironic because she talks so much about being self-reflective and that in that moment she was completely incapable of doing that and can and seemingly at least maybe privately she's in process but publicly we haven't seen her um be transformed or even like taking in the critique and saying this I've heard what yeah. my what my what my friends have said. I've heard what my trans um, audience members have said, and I need to hold myself accountable. And I need to I need to I can do better, and I will yeah. work on this. And, and this I, is the process, right? Yeah. So that is like because we have to envision a world because we all internalize transphobia, um, white supremacy, yeah. classism, etc. So what is, what does the transformation look like? And there's just yeah. not enough work because we because there's no profit motive in that, right? The work is exactly. calling each other out fighting and so it's like again so it goes back to capitalism so modeling transformation modeling yeah. what that looks like is so crucial and then even someone saying you know i used to feel this way about trans people and then like i was you know a dear friend of mine or even just getting to know some twatty trans or doing my own yeah. research i realized that that was erroneous for whatever reason or yeah. about black people or about immigrants i remember when i got to college and at indiana university like you know back in the day and i Ooh, it's, a, it's a weird thing to say out loud. <laughs> but I believed that it, that if you're in America, you should speak English. Like, you know, this is like 18-year-old me who's, you know, from Alabama. And I was just like, well, you should speak English. And someone was like, tell me more. And they kind of called me out and it was loving. Yeah. And I had to like interrogate what that was about and what I had internalized. And... It makes me cringe when I think about that now, yeah. you know, it was 30 years ago, but like, though, and it's uncomfortable. Yeah. I think being willing, and I've talked about this too with my own, some of my own um, moments publicly when I've been called out, you know, um, yeah. by my community and I've had to hold myself accountable or, or allow myself to be held accountable. It is deeply uncomfortable, yeah. especially publicly. It was, it was a moment on Twitter when I, um, that I, I gave a commencement address about many years ago when um, Alabama passed. <laughs> My home, I'm from Alabama, and Alabama passed yeah. that, one of their abor- abortion restrictions, and I retweeted a friend who said, a woman's body, a woman's choice, end of story. And I retweeted that, and a trans man was like, Laverne, you're really going to erase trans men and non-binary people in this discussion? I was just like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had the moment, yeah. like, Ugh. And this was years ago. You know, this was... Um, God, this is probably like four or five years ago. And I had to just, it was so uncomfortable. It was so, I remember just this, you know, I've learned to sit with, in my trauma work, I've learned to sit with uncomfortable feelings too. Um, It's a process. I remember just being so uncomfortable and I felt so called out. And in the moment I said, thank you for bringing this to my attention. I'll think about it. And I just felt like shamed and I felt like all this stuff, like it just felt really yucky inside. And I had to reflect on why that felt yucky, what that moment was about. And it's okay to have, to feel uncomfortable for a minute. You know, it really is because that is what's going to get us to the other side. That's what's going to get me to the other side. And days later, I I, I had the privilege of giving a commitment address where I talked about that, where I talked about those uncomfortable moments of of, of being um, held accountable and I could have lashed out. We go into it's it's we're, when we're shamed. Shame had when we the shame response that we have. So I was publicly shamed, and I felt and there's a difference between shaming someone and feeling shame, feeling right? Shamed, yeah. So I 
felt shamed in that moment. And we respond to shame. We move away, we move towards, or we move against, which is yeah. the um, same response that we have when we're to, to trauma. It's fight, yeah. flight, or freeze, right? So it's the fight, flight, or freeze, moving away towards or against. So a lot of people, when they're called out, and I would suggest that this, what it seemed, what seemed to happen with Anna Kasparian, we're using her as an example now, is that she lashed out, that she went into yeah. the fight um, part of the fight, flight, or freeze, right? And I kind of, I froze and, you know, I, I tend to internalize things and I don't want to be fighting people on Twitter. Yeah. And, but so it's just like, how do we sit with that, that, the, the, yeah. that uncomfortability that in that impulse to fight that's biological that we all have yeah and how do we like you know and then when we do fight when we maybe need to just listen how do we hold ourselves accountable and be and yeah. be transformed and allow ourselves to be transformed because that's how we get to the next place in yeah. terms of acknowledging each other's humanity and you know listen it's a, it is very much so a conscious effort because even with the Anna Kasparian stuff I I, I I put myself in her shoes in understanding like it can be it's very frustrating being the character of the day on Twitter and when people are are on your head regardless and because we have a natural response to defend ourselves whether or not right wrong or if somebody says something bad about me I don't like that you know so you know I understand those things I also think it's something I try to be mindful of because I recognize that you will always you're not always going to be I've been dragged on Twitter several times myself it will happen again I am sure um and I try to <laughs> yes <laughs> and what I try to do now is make a conscious effort to like go on creators that I like and I respect like watch their streams even when they're criticizing me and take it you know what I mean watch it and what I normally realize is if I get past the criticism, the constructive criticism, I usually hear something positive. I realize they're coming from a good place and I can, you know, receive it. And I when it's constructive, I like, though. When I it's constructive. When it's constructive, yes. When it's constructive. You. Trust That's me, important. no, no, Laverne, I will drag. This is torture. It's torture to just sit and watch somebody, like, misconstrue oh, I ain't your doing arguments. That. And, no, oh, I ain't no, no, doing no, no, that. No, no. Do that ain't happening, Laverne. Oh, ain't no way. Ain't no way. Um, but something I also think is something, too, is I think we have to really think about our communities. Because something that I notice, re like, repeatedly in that situation is, yes, everybody trying to bring her in. But none of the people trying to bring her in or who are friends whether the community that you're in are actually members of that community. And I think that makes a difference, right? Because I've had a lot of conversations with like white content creators about racist things they would do and that they're sorry for now. And I'll be like, but black people told you that was wrong then. And they were like, not no black people. I was friends, but I don't know no black. I didn't, I wasn't in community with black people that I valued or I humanized or I whatever it is. So I think that is something to be, that we have to be mindful of. It's not good enough for us to say, you know, I believe in the right thing. So I will advocate for trans people, but I don't know them. They're a distant unicorn fairy tale to me. I don't have any of those friends. I'm not in community with that. Cause that makes a difference. Like something that happened oh God, to me yeah. yesterday, I was gonna go to Queerpalooza, Queerpalooza uh, for pride. And if you are a queer person, a queer, um, any femme, anybody like that, you should go to Queerpalooza, it's gonna be a ball. And I was gonna go and Queerpalooza put out a statement that was like, nah. <laughs> they were like, they're like, if you are not, you know, if you are, um, you know, a, a cis, cis, straight people, stay out of here, okay? It's not just space. And I was like, you know what? And I remember I seen it and I sent it to my two gay besties and they were like, they were like, yeah, and that is fine. And I'm like, yeah, and that is fine. Whatever your initial oomph to feel, oh, excluded. And I was like, as they should, as they fucking should exclude me. And, and that was something me stopping to say, huh, I had my own moment for a split second. It was only a split second, but of me being like, well, I can't be there. And then I thought about how I feel when I'm trying to talk to black people directly and white people respond. And I'm like, this isn't about excluding you. This isn't even about you. This is about considering people. And I, what I realized, the reason why I'm able to do that is because I genuinely am in community with these people and I hear yeah. them and I can. I think that's something important that we have to go forward with these platforms. Like it's not enough to make my platform allegedly inclusive in rhetoric, but I got my platform should be an extension of the life I live, the people that I really do talk to and hear from, because I think that <clears throat> informs who we listen to. Like this interview is great because I went to my friends. <laughs> like, hey, what yeah. do you really <clears throat> Yeah, and living, living, you know, and sometimes it's hard to go out and meet people from different communities and we don't want to have like our token whatever friend, right? It, it, yeah. it should be about that. But how do we have people around us who are like-minded but diverse in some way? That is like, I mean, it's easier in New York, you know, I think it's easier in, in certain places, but there are parts of the country where we're just 
where folks are just, I mean, segreg like racial segregation is still such a huge thing in, in parts of this country. But having, live, being in community makes such a difference, right? If you had that dear, dear friend, trans friend of yours who's like, girl, I love you so much, and you know I see you, but this, you were dead wrong on this, you know, and, and, and yeah. you're dead wrong because of this, right? Mm -hmm. And and that I it it make it I, that does make a difference when you are in it community. Does. And it's and that's a tricky thing. And um because you don't want to just go out and find, you know, a token, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah, that's that's so much of the work. But then it's just like so but but Again, it's like the rehumanizing process. Brene Brown uses that term in her book, Brave in the Wilderness, which I think is a must read for these times. She uses the term rehumanizing, that we have to rehumanize ourselves and each other in a, a cultural and political environment that has us at each other's throats, that seeks to be like, if you're not with us, you're against us, the us versus them stuff that is so dehumanizing, yeah. like the work is to, if that's what we're interested in, there's so many people just making money, right? Off yeah. this division, corporations, individuals, and, and we see it's just a grift for so many yeah. folks. But for those of us, and I believe, I want to believe in the humanity and the goodness of, 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 of regular people, right? That yeah. we want to be in a space where we are loving, and there's just so much energy to like be in this hateful place. And it's just yeah. such negative energy. I'm like, who wants to walk around like that? That <laughs> so like, and, it's de and it dehumanizes us too. So the, the work of like, you know, be acknowledging my own humanity. And, that, and when I say that, you know, and this is me being the artistic part of me as an actor, I have to, approach every character I play with empathy. I cannot judge that character because the second I'm judging a character, I can't be in her shoes. I can't yeah. fully play her with the um, layers and humanity that she needs. And so I, I try to bring that practice into, into real life. And when I say that everybody has a struggle, everybody is has been through something and have land, they've landed where they are because of some reason, some psychological, emotional reason. They weren't loved enough as a child. They were abused. They were whatever. You know, that's yeah. the human human piece. There's certainly, you know, many media figures who are, you know, doing the propaganda and doing all the misinformation stuff who are not acting in good faith and it's hard to see those folks as human beings, but they have a story too. And they've maybe chosen yeah. this corrupt path out of some scarcity, something or other. And so having compassion for them, even as we, you know, do it from a distance with some boundaries, you know, we don't need to invite these people into our lives. You know, Brene Brown also says the most compassionate people are the most boundaried. So having lovely, healthy boundaries is important, but like really being in the space of like beyond like, you know, pundits and politicians and, and, and that, everyday people like the people yeah. who are who are who we see on the street the people in our lives um how do we humanize them you know, and, yeah. and and walk through the world in my humanity a meaning i can't i don't have the right to judge anybody else because i am fallible i've made mistakes i have done some shit that i's like not cute at all and <laughs> Every and everybody's going through something, so yeah. it's like I can't judge you because I my shit is messy and I'm, yeah. I'm in process. That's what I'm. Our shared humanity is that we're all going through something, and can yeah. we acknowledge that 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 we're all going through something at different levels of privilege? And I think being able to acknowledge privilege is important. And it's like, oh God, the privilege conversation. You know, and it's something right? <laughs> that's a whole other thing, have... but. We all and we all have it in in different ways and other ways we don't, right? And, and privilege is contextual. Think. It's like in a, in one room you might be the most privileged person, and in another room you might be the least. Exactly. So it's, anyway. Exactly. You know that made me think of because first of all, you recently celebrated your fifty first birthday. Yes. Happy. I told you happy birthday online on the day of, but I'm telling you it again here. <laughs> um, first of all, and also pictures, videos, everything, fantastic. Wow, chef's kiss. You didn't miss. <laughs> no notes. And what I wanted to say is one, I wanted to. One, just celebrate that. And also something I feel like is always left out of the conversation. Tra Black trans women are left out of the conversation to me in a way that bothers me in mainstream media. And, you know, there's this this intentional, just <clears throat> nefarious attempt to dismiss and trivialize trans issues. And I, I find that 
what is so startling is the lifespan, the average lifespan that we know of black trans women and that. And so I wanted to know, like, what's that, what does that feel for you reaching to 51 in light of all these things, which you've been able to accomplish in this world around for your sisters? It, it, I mean, it feels like a miracle. A dear friend of mine, whew, it feels like a miracle that I'm alive. You know, I, you know, in so many ways, I'm not supposed to be here. You know, if, you know when you think of the, st- you know, statistics that that at that um, stat that you know the average lifespan of a black trans woman is 35 years old. It's like when you hear that, it's like, oh my god, that's it's and and when you, ugh, it's it's so deep. I was talking to a dear friend of mine, Honey Dijon. We were talking um, recently. I need to reach out to her again. Um, you know, she just won her first Grammy for producing two tracks on Beyonce's Renaissance um, album, and, and she. Crazy. I've known Honey for twenty five years, um, and we came up in New York at the same time. She's a black trans woman living in London now and DJing all over the world and winning Grammys and uh, very successful. And she's just like. She says the same thing. I'm I'm alive. Like the the most thing I'm most proud of is that I'm st- I'm a, I'm still here. I'm not even supposed to be here. When you, especially in the '90s, you know, like you know, yeah. transitioning in the '90s in New York and just walking down the street, you know, just yeah. walking down the act of being trans and black, particularly at that intersection, and having the audacity to like walk down the street is like. And then if you get from point A to point B, you know without someone physically attacking you. Because the verbal attacks were just a part of my day-to-day life. That was just what it was that I got used to. That, like, people are going to, you know, misgender me and laugh at me when I walk into subways and subway cars. And that was just my life. And But just to, to get home alive was... Um, just felt... I made it because it was a war and there are girls still and I, and I you know, I, I get to get in a car, you know, now <laughs> I haven't taken the subway in a minute. So this is, these are the levels of privilege that shield me from that. Um, but there are girls still walking around. There are trans girls in the hood right now, not in the hood, who leave their house and it's like, you know, okay. and the girls with the um, tasers and the box cutters and the hammers and the pepper spray because stuff might pop off. Like, all that stuff is so real that we're living right now. And and that's never changed for Black trans women specifically and for non- our non-binary siblings as well. The danger, the physical danger of just being trans and particularly femme in public across yeah. that femme spectrum, the the danger of that just it's it's just really deep so I, I I'm grateful to be alive but again I always think about I think about my my, my siblings who are still in that like <sighs> bracing yourself before you leave the house you know and I have yeah. make, the makeup is armor or like just being hyper aware you know just to walk out of the door you know yeah um so it's it's wonder it's a it's wonderful and it's a miracle and it's great. Um and I want to rejoice and celebrate that and I want and I you know I, I don't like to focus on things that are dire but it's like it's important to contextualize things too, yeah. you know. Um but then I was also, you know, the both end of it is that like yes um, I'm a black trans woman, but my mom was a teacher and she corrected yeah. my grammar and I wanted to go to the Alabama School of Fine Arts to study ballet. And I did in high school and it was a boarding school. And so I was surrounded by mostly white kids from affluent backgrounds. And that was really challenging and hard. And I didn't realize that one of the skills I was learning in addition to classical ballet and you know all my AP classes is I was also learning how to make white people comfortable. Exactly. I didn't know that that was a skill set that I was learning at the Alabama School of Fine Arts that it's also served me well in, in yeah. this um, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, to um, quote bell hooks. So it's those privileges, right? Like that, yeah. yes, I'm a black trans woman, but those privileges are in part why I'm, why I've managed to be alive and I've managed not to do drugs, you know, and I've yeah. managed to like, I mean, I think like I'd, I've never believed that, you know, recreational drug use is something. And I, you know, I don't, I think, I'm all about, you know, decriminalizing drugs and all that. But I've I believe, and maybe it's a generational thing, that as a as a working class black person, that casual drug use is not something I could do. 
that like yeah. that was not something that I could do and think I would like be successful for me yeah. personally because the consequences were different, right? Yeah. That like, you know, I don't have like somebody to bail me out of jail or uh, it, it, it's just it's a, it, and just ODing and becoming addicted and like so so yeah. the 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 desire to, you know, 23 years ago when I went to therapy at Callan Lord, the Callan Lord Community Health Center, when I started getting my um, gender affirming care there here in New York, they required therapy. And I didn't think I needed therapy. And yeah. oh my God, I needed therapy, right? <laughs> so, so much of the reason I'm here at 51 is that I've been in therapy for all these years and I've been committed to um, personal healing and 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 dealing with my demons and traumas there's so much trauma in yeah. my in, from my childhood but there was also so much resilience too for a long yeah. time i talked about like the tra trauma in my childhood but there were so many beautiful things like this te mother who was a teacher and me taking her letting me take dance classes and going to the alabama school of fine arts and being a straight a student and figuring out that like you know i was a good public speaker and like you know summarizing the Sunday school lesson every day in this oppressive religious context you know that was yeah. also wonderful you know so the both and of it um it's so there, that, that's that, that you know all of it is why I'm here like the the challenges and the beautiful resources are why I'm here and I was thinking too as an aside as a black trans woman I was thinking about the whole Dylan Mulvaney thing and Bud okay. Light right and I was um and obviously she has 10 million followers on TikTok and TikTok is the thing right now I have 6.6 .6 million followers on Instagram, and I'm not that big on, on TikTok. And I had um, an ad campaign with Smirnoff for three years. You know, yeah. obviously, this is the anti-trans year, right? This is the year yeah. where they just, they're, they're going hard, right? They're going really, really hard. Yeah. And I noticed that I'm not on the right wing's radar the same way that a Dylan Mulvaney would be. And it's yeah. rare that um, trans people of color, and particularly trans women of color, are on the radar of right wing media in the same way that like a white trans person would be. And I'm I grateful for that. for that. I'm sorry? I think there's a reason for that. Oh, there's a reason. I'm grateful for mm -hmm. it, but it's like, I'm really grateful because I don't want to be in that mess. But I think it's like they don't, they can't, they can't see, they, they, <laughs> does not yes. transmit. They can't. Yeah. This, they can't see the yeah. like the racism is so deep. The massage noir is so deep that they just yeah. can't even like comprehend no. this. They like they talk about Lizzo. You know, it seems like that's the only black woman they can find. You know, figure out how yeah. to talk about. <laughs> but you know what I've realized? I've noticed, especially in looking at like black people that are are becoming mouthpieces for for transphobia. The way that they do it and they are able to justify it to the black community is by selling it as some kind of um, like like as though trans rights is somehow anti-black, like they make it say separate it, you know, the need to they pretend make it a white thing. Trans, if this is a white thing, this is some they white make it a mess. white thing. And so by, by allowing them to, if they focus on the Dylan Mulvaney's, if they focus and, and they focus on a, a white trans person that is seemingly to the public doing well, because they have millions of dollars, whatever it is, it allows them to trivialize trans issues to, to go after a black trans woman would have to open up the discourse to issues that affect black trans women, which are by no means Trivial, you can't trivialize them once you know them, so they keep them out the conversation. And they're interse and they're intersectional. Um, it's and and then and arguments fall apart. You know, I have not said this person's name publicly, and we will. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it right now. Dave Chappelle, Dave Dave yeah. Chappelle, and his closer thing. I haven't because I, I didn't want to be in that mess. In that, <laughs> I don't ever want to be like. Because people will have a headline: Laverne Cox calls out blah blah blah, and that's not yeah. anything I've ever been interested in. But What's interesting, and I'm not the first person to say this, what's interesting about Dave Chappelle is that never does he talk about black trans folks either. That's, his, that's exactly arguments, who I was thinking his of. His arguments completely fall apart when he when you acknowledge that black trans yeah. people exist. Yeah. It's always white. I mean, he literally talked about Caitlyn Jenner as like, you know, the epitome of like white privilege because like, in whatever I forget the context, and it was yeah. just I was sitting there, I was sitting here with my black and my black ass self, being like, <laughs> um, wait, what? Right. So, and then all of the trans people that he cites, all of them, and I know one of them that he talked yeah. about in the closer, and he completely lied about. Um, um, anyway, I should be careful about that because I don't want to. I got you. So he he lied about some of that stuff but all of the arguments fall apart when you acknowledge that black trans people exist exist all of it yeah. sort of falls apart so it just 
it's it's not and the, for the, yeah for the black community it's like it's so interesting that's so much that's so much of why I wanted to go on the Breakfast Club um, and do okay. the interview there and I also reached out to Joe Rogan's people and I, I we have not gotten a response from his people but that's part of why I wanted to go on the Breakfast Club to just be myself and just be a human being yeah. certainly they brought up you know trans issues and we talked about them and it was a lovely conversation and then you know you know, the Breakfast Club did what the Breakfast Club did and I have love for them and it was, and they were love, they were so lovely to me. I know you've been on the Breakfast Club as well. They were so lovely to me and yeah, it's just, you know, it's, for me, it's just about like, how do I go on and just be human, you know, and I, and and have fun and just be, be myself. Um, And I want you to know, I, I have at least my last, I'm going to ask you one more serious question before I pivot to the fun things I, I have to ask you before I let you get out of here. Mm-hmm. The, um, what I read, so something, as somebody I, I deal with, you know, they come from my head all the time and something that always makes me really comfortable when people ask me, how do you deal with that is I really, really remind myself that I am not new. I am not, special. like anything that I experience, someone has experienced everybody before me is experienced, you know, Amen. and I looked to like Audrey Lord and hear her say there are no new pains. And so when I heard you tell your story about what it means to transition in the nineties in New York and all of this, I'm like, I know that there's somebody hearing that experiencing that, or like, wow, you've got from there to there. And like, what would you say to those people? Like, well, if you could talk to yourself at the time or anybody who's going through that, what, what would be the advice that you give them or the words that you think that would really motivate them? I think that as I said this like a lot in the first season of my podcast and I believe this I think that like when I think about myself in the world I think that there are that it's important to acknowledge that there are some things that are systemic right that there that racism transphobia all these things exist and are going to affect my day-to-day life but then what is my 50 percent yeah. What is my 50% in this? Where is the possibility of resistance to all that? Right? That not to not be in denial of it, but like, what's my 50%? What can I do today to elevate my circumstances and my mental health? I think that there's, there's, a, there's a mental health component to it, to acknowledging. I think therapy is so important. If you are in people, places, and things is so important. Like, yeah. so trying to surround yourself with people who are going to affirm you. I am so... I'm so blessed. And I've been, ve- I'm very particular about who I invite into my circle. And I didn't, and one of my best friend, girlfriends, I could cry right now. One of my best girlfriends, Mila, the Mila Jam on, on she's, a, she's a singer and a recording artist and so many other things. We, um, we, I met her in 2005 and she was like, you know, oh, I want to hang out. And I was like, oh, I don't really do that. And in 2005, <laughs> I was very, I didn't have any girlfriends. I didn't have many friends. I was so yeah. protective of myself because I just had been so traumatized and I didn't let people in. In. And Mila is so amazing. <laughs> and I remember she was like, oh, I can hang, we can add it to your place. I was like, I don't do that. <laughs> and at the time, there was also shame around the 315 square foot apartment I lived in. And I didn't, part of I, part of the reason I didn't entertain and invite people over is because I was ashamed of my apartment. But it's also yeah. like, you know, so that was class, internalized class shame. But it was also like, I just kept people at a distance. And Mila is just so amazing and wonderful and we have so much in common she's from the south she grew up dancing and performing too she doesn't do drugs she's just such a light she is such a light she's a black trans woman too and like over the years like we started hanging out and then like i remember she tells this story and i didn't remember it she she always tells the story i was like oh we were hanging out i was like oh why don't you come up and she was just like i'm coming up i mean i'm being let in and i just it was like and she and with her and so many the 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 um group of trans women that like I call my like you know my family family um we all most of us are artists and you know we, none of us do drugs and I say the drug thing because there is a culture sometimes when you and for a lot of young trans um women specifically I'll talk about my experience where we come out and we're in clubs and we find ourselves and people are doing drugs and there's a and that is it is what it is and people do drugs for so many reasons and i get why people want to numb there's a lot to numb ourselves from but 
I just can't, ha- I can't be close friends with people who are active drug users. It's just not yeah. ever been something I could do. And part of it's because I've never done drugs too. So like, yeah. it's just, I was talking to a friend the other day about like, when people are on drugs and you're not, there's this weird suspicion thing going on. It's weird, <laughs> you know? So it's like, and I get, I don't poo poo anybody doing when I don't, and I don't count weed as that, just be that way. I don't count weed as in, in the context of that. I think, Smoke your weed, honey. I'm I'm not mad at anybody smoking their weed. But any but it was when I Mila and 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 Jocelyn and Peppermint and 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 Trace, the group of women that we um that we sort of have formed that is like a family and a sisterhood is like so important to just affirm yeah. each other and to be truly seen and known that is such a I think like when um trying to surround yourself with people who really see you because I think so yeah. often as for, for um trans folks particularly coming from whatever environments people don't see us people can't acknowledge us people like don't they have all these narratives about who we are if you can have somebody one person who sees you and who can mirror back your authentic self to you, that shit is life-saving. It really yeah. and truly is. And so, but slowly, but slowly bringing in the right people into your life and letting go of the energy and the people who aren't going to serve us and who are going to keep us in. Everybody's not excited for our success either. I was talking about this with, with the girls the other day. There was a trans woman who I was really close to and then, you know, I kind of blew up and then our relationship shifted. And I was just yeah. sort of like... And I didn't take it personally. I don't take things personally, but I this in retrospect, this was years ago. But just like everybody's not happy for you, and yeah. I did, and it, yeah. I was like, okay, that's what was going on there, and that's okay. And that person is dealing with what they're dealing with, and I have love for them yeah. still. So surrounding yourself with really good energy and really good people, and letting go of those people and those energies that are not serving us, and understanding that you were put here for a purpose and for a reason, and that trans is beautiful. That like wherever mm-hmm. you want to go in your transition um, is fine. But like so much of like, you know, because when you don't have money, <laughs> And I'm actually really glad I didn't have money early in my transition. Because, girl, I would have probably had way too much surgery and look, be looking real crazy right now. Um, <laughs> so the blessing of not being poor uh, for most of my, my, my adult life kept me from, like, some crazy surgery. But, like, wherever you are in your transition, being able to embrace today that, like, yeah. The things that are beautiful about me, I really, I, I believe this in my spirit. You know, I have to remind myself. I started the hashtag trans is beautiful in 2015 to remind myself and other trans people that I'm not beautiful despite my big hands, my big feet, my deep voice, my wide shoulders, my height, all the things that make me noticeably trans. I'm beautiful because of those things. I could yeah. look at other trans women who were noticeably trans, right, and see their beauty. I really could. And I, I, right. I could at the time. I still can. And they have things that are noticeably trans about them. Um, yeah. And I can see their beauty, but I couldn't see it in myself. And yeah. now I can. Now I can. And so that is so much part of the piece, too, because this, like, what really figuring out what self-love is and, like, yeah. and, and, and a practice of self-love, how we treat ourselves. People always talk about self-love, but not in a way that's, like, an active practice, Um how we treat ourselves, what we say to ourselves about ourselves, those internalized messages, like unpacking all of that so that we can be good with ourselves. I got to be good with myself first before I can go out into the world and conquer it. I can't, I mean, there are people who don't like themselves who are, you know, doing whatever, but like being, interrogating all that and figuring out, getting a practice um, with therapy, with um, friends. If you need to be in some kind of 12-step program to, to get off drugs or alcohol, there those meetings are free and those yeah. meetings save people's lives. So, like, that's loving yourself, like, doing all that work. And then when you can begin, I think the blessing for me, and I, did, I didn't, I was interviewing Leslie Jones um, for my show, If We're Being Honest, and she talked about how Cat Williams William said, "You're gonna, um, you're gonna um, break through, and you're gonna be famous when you let go of your desperation." And because she, I always used to see Leslie Jones say, you know, because she would um, run after Chris Rock, and she knew Chris for years. She's like, "When are you gonna put me on? I'm not gonna be famous until somebody puts me on." And Chris said, "You're not ready." And I was like, "But she would never say why." What he meant by yeah. that, and yeah. what he meant. 
It was what Cat Williams said, is that you're leading with your desperation, not your talent. When you let go of your desperation, then it'll happen for you. And that desperation, for me... That's, I was in that space for 20... I mean, I moved to New York in 1993 and Orange is New Black premiered in 2013. That was literally yeah. 20 years later. I was working. I was working on my craft. I was, and I was prepared when that happened. But there was so much desperation. There was so much not-enoughness that I was operating from. And I had to go through a process to let all that go. I actually was going to quit acting. Um, Leslie was going to probably kill herself. And she didn't give a fuck. And she stopped yeah. doing her hair. And that's when Chris was like, you're ready. When she was like, I don't, even, I don't think I want to live anymore. So yeah. that's the de- We have to let go of so much to step into who we're meant to be. Like who we're meant to be in that way. And people criticize Oprah. I live for Oprah. Don't come for Oprah. But that person that we are meant to be, that person that God put us here to be, we have yeah. to let go of stuff because we because we get all the stuff is put on us, right? And imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy. We have to let go of so much to get to that pure divine light. If 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 people see a light in me, it is because uh, on a daily day, daily basis, I'm working to let go of all this stuff. So the yeah. light that, that that God has placed in me, and I'm not a religious person, but I'm a spiritual person, the light that God put in me can shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. So that I, I'm just letting go of all these things that are going to keep me from the, from the divine that is yeah. within me. And so that's what I would say. And then and surrounding yourself with the right people, putting yourself in the right situations, doing every single thing you can to let go of shame of yeah. trauma to heal to 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 you know and the, the the thing i will say about the drugs is that it numb or anything to numb right we're addicted yeah. to our phones we're addicted to shopping we're addicted to our, we me uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's keep let's keep it up keep it in the eye all these things that we use to chronically numb right they keep us from you can, you can't selectively numb feelings yeah. so when we numb the bad stuff we're numbing the good stuff too and the good stuff is like that's the that's that's the that's the juice, and we got to be able to like get up, get rid of all the mess, so we can see the good stuff in, in us, and then yes. we can see it. Then the world can see it. That is beautiful, Lauren. And speaking of the good stuff, let me make that my yes. last question. We can, no, we can take. We, if you have a few more questions, I can take a little more time unless you need to go. Good. No, I, 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 I have long go. answers, so I'm like, no, oh. you are you are my plans, Laverne. <laughs> like this, uh, my friend Philip, he said, and he he, this is his specific question. He worded it like this, and he said, ask it like this. He said, when you go out and you definitely want to show out, what's the most sickening pump you feel the most sexy in? That's oh it. God, you know, so I don't, I really don't wear heels like a lot, like in real life, like I wear He's heels. Gonna cry. For photo shoots, and I wear heels for photo shoots. I went, I went out. I actually did wear, I did wear heels. I, I went to dinner the other night. And I wore a little. It was, it was a comfy little um, booty. Um, <laughs> to feel sickening, I love like a a, a pant legging right now. I'm really into yeah. like pant leggings and like over the knee boots, like a like a nice like that just just skin tight and a pant legging. Yeah. Like I just live for that. I just bring that look up. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad right. you bring that look up because that brings me to my last question. Um, that will bring me into your trip hop rug <laughs> because Philip says, he says, you have a vintage and he believes, look how much he in your business. He said, she has a vintage, I believe, black mouglé jacket that's stunning. And in addition to that piece, what's another fave vintage piece that you have? And I know you had a million special pieces in trip hop rug that I would love you to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I love, I co- I've started, you know, I started collecting vintage mouglé. It's so funny. For, I didn't even realize I could until like 2019. And I started collecting, just bought my first Mugler jacket and then like, you know, went down a rabbit hole. I'm like, I can get this. Um, God, my favorites. Um, some of them are in storage. God, I mean, I love, I mean, there's, it's mostly Mugler, but I also love Galliano. Um, I love McQueen. I love some Comme de Garçon. Um, it's my favorite. There is this jacket. Um, is it in the closet now? No, but there's, um, I did, there's a video I can send you a clip of it. There's a video where I do some of my Mugler collection on that's on YouTube. There's a beautiful jacket that is um, from his um, Mugler's 1989 Buick Winter collection, Buick Hiver, where he was inspired by cars. And it has this incredible um, 
hardware on the side and actually have the jacket that I wore on the Breakfast Club has the same hardware, the Moto jacket, which I'm also yeah. obsessed with. It's hard for me to pick a favorite. It's like picking your um, between your children. But I love <laughs> that collection so much and I love that hardware is like and that was just kind of a dream for me to like yeah. own that jacket for a long time I coveted that yeah. jacket and then to have the moto version of it um yeah that's one of my favorites I'll say that but there's there's a lot it's, there's gonna be a movie there too and then in the video the um in, in um summertime a trip opera there's uh, an inc- oh. The last outfit that I wear in front of the red curtain is um, a, M- a Mugler piece that I wanted for years. And that I actually, looks so good. I found the cape. So it's a cape and it's a um, kind of peplum skirt. And I, it just wasn't anywhere. Um, I was just searching and I, it just came. One day I was on Etsy and boom, it popped up. And I bought it and needed just mild alterations. And that piece makes me so happy. And if you go to, if you're a fashion person and you go to like Vogue Runway and you can like look at um, Terry Mugler's show from 1995, it was his 20th anniversary sh- um, show, that piece is not there. They were like, 300 pieces in the show, but you have to watch the show. There's a moment when the model model slides down a staircase in this look, and then she walks around the perimeter of the runway. These shows were like theatrical productions. And she walks around the perimeter of the um, of the stage because there's like a runway in the center and then there's like a perimeter. And she's walking, right. so there's a video and I'll, I'll put it in, I'm, I'm doing a whole video on like the looks from the video, from my music video. Right. And you'll see the look there. And I just am obsessed with that look, partly because I think it's just so, this, it's the structure. For me, with Mugler, it's the structure, it's the architecture. I've always loved architectural fashion. There's something, because it feels like art. You know, I grew up, yeah. I'm an, at the end of the day, I'm an art school kid. I One of the great things about being at the Alabama School of Fine Arts is I got to, like, you know, any week I could go to a, you know, a play in the theater department. I could go to an a opera recital or a violin recital or you know, play and just being surrounded by by art is just the best thing for me. And so I, when I look at the best of Mugler for me, it's like in that piece particularly, the architecture of it feels like art. It feels like art to me, and like art is the most healing thing in in the world for me. And that and that video too, it's like it's an interesting. It's been wonderful. We're like at a, over a hundred thousand views on YouTube, which is like crazy. And and it's a, it's kind of an artsy conceptual idea to have this. Uh, these opera vocals to this kind of trap beat, you know, and I'm calling it trip opera. And it's because it's artsy thing, but I think the fashion piece, I wanted to bring in fashion and some elements from like a, that you might see in a hip hop video, right? I love it. Um, That could like just, I, these are things I love. I mean, a lot of this is about bringing together things. I, I love opera. I love hip hop. I love, you know, Beyonce. I love fashion. I just bring all together all these things that I love and have it be an artistic expression. And being an artist for me right now feels like the most healing thing. It's the thing that got me through my childhood. And these yeah. are the... It's one of the most difficult times. I mean, I think one, one person said that there have been more um, anti-LGBT bills introduced this year than the entire history yes. of this country combined, yes. all the years yes. that this country has yes. existed. So these are really difficult times. And what got me through my childhood was was um, was dancing and having music in my head. And when the kids were bullying me, I would just start dancing everywhere and have music in my head and this dreaming of being creative, you know, and I played dress up as a kid. These are the things that got me through a difficult childhood and these are the things that still get me through and so getting to be an artist and getting to like you know I directed this video I styled myself I produced it I basically edited it too I had editors but I was like this is you know that's how I want it I know Uh, I I know (laughs) and even conceiving of the project you know I'm going to different you know Hector Fonseca who did the um 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 remix for the remix the track I you know I recorded these vocals in 2021 and he kind of hooked me up with different producers and DJs and all the remixes I'm not feeling but then this one just and then the the follow-up I just it's just it just gave me life and I was like this is like 
this is something. This feels yeah. like something special. And so it's just great to be able to be an artist and be ex- and express myself. It's just, it's deeply healing. And I need yeah. that right now. And I think we need to find in these troubling times, the things that bring us joy, the things that bring us healing, that, that those things are in place so that we don't get sucked into the mire of, 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 of the depression of like all the things that are going on in the world that could like take us out and that yeah. are trying to take us out. Um, what is what brings you joy? What makes you happy? What puts a smile on your face and makes you want to go on? And and being an artist and being creative in this way has been so healing and wonderful for me. Laverne, thank you so much. Like, thank you. you. Listen, you say you know you say oh I got to New York in 1993 and I listen I was born in 1993, so I want you to know <laughs> when you. <laughs> You think, oh, it took you 20 years, oh, Orange and New Black? Listen, you have no idea how many people's lives you touch and inspire and try, who will never be as lucky as I am in this moment to be able to tell you. But I remember being in Athens, Ohio, being like, wow, like, wow. And I felt that way every second of your career since. And I am so humbled and glad. When is your birthday? You were born in 93. What? July 27th. I will oh, be 30. Oh, you coming up. So you yeah, can't girl. Have cancer still? No, Leo. you're in Leo. A true Leo, Leo. Laverne. A true Obviously. Leo. Obviously. <laughs> Yeah. Let me yeah. jump. Um, it's so funny. My boyfriend was, was born in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead, 90s babies. <laughs> I, we were talking and I was just like, I was telling him, like, I was like, I moved to New York in 1993. He's like, yeah, that's, I was like, he was born in 94. But like, yeah, that's deep. So you're about to be 30. Yes, I'm about to be 30. You're not even 30 yet. Can I just tell you how brilliant you are and how, what a light you are and how you break shit down and I just, there's something so incredible about you that it's just, I live and that's why I'm here because I, that I live for you and I love, I love new media, but I live for you. I think your voice is so important. Your energy, all the aspects of your humanity that like yeah. you could be this, you know, well-resourced, you know, sources cited, you know, um, Mm -hmm. a movement lawyer, but they're, but you're fun and you're fly and you don't give a fuck, you (laughs) know, and it's just, I I live, you're just a superstar, you know, and I think that for what I would, what I'll say to you at this stage in your life, I don't know if you're having a return to Saturn moment, is that like keeping that understanding that you're a superstar, but like also like, you know, don't, just beware of ego. Just beware yeah. of ego. I'm, and listen, I, Laverne, I am, wor- trust me, I am very hyper cognizant of it because listen, my, and my daddy is going to watch this and I love you, daddy, but my daddy, I've had an ex-boyfriend said, your daddy made a fine young man in you. <laughs> and I, I definitely can have an ego tendency about my spirit. So I try to be hyper cognizant of it. And thank God I have friends that will humble my black ass every And it's nothing day. wrong with being confident. Yes, confidence I know. Is- wonderful and we love that confidence about you when i say ego it's like i this is something i check in myself and that's the only reason i'm saying it because i feel like sometimes for me when i there was a moment and um around 2016 and i was you know i was I started feeling myself a little bit, you know, it was like I had, you know, a show on CBS. I had a show on Fox. (laughs) I was, you know, I was, I was feeling myself. I was feeling cute. And the beautiful thing about that is that the world humbled me. Like when you, even in Hollywood, even with all of the, you know, success I've had, like I'm still, I'm still a black trans woman and I, and I, and I, and I'm not old money. There's a whole other level of celebrity. Like when you go to there's certain parties you go to or certain people you meet and there's a whole <laughs> other level of like fame and celebrity and money that I probably will never have fully have access to. And I'm okay yeah. with that because there's mm-hmm. so that's fair weather shit. That's also like me wanting to like get into those spaces feels like that would be about my ego and not yeah. why I'm really here, which is about art, which is about yeah. telling stories. You know, it's not about like hobnobbing. You know, I've had these, for me, my ego is like, Oh, I should be hobnobbing. I'm on Instagram. I should be, I know this celebrity. She loves me. Why am I not on the yacht that's with her, thing. you know, and all the girls, you know, key keying. Yeah. I have, and that's like about my ego, right? That's yeah. about that's some bullshit. That's about my ego. And that's the stuff I have to, I have to be aware of yeah. right now and let go of and not, and not like, cause not get caught up, you know, for me, yeah. it's like, cause it getting caught up and like the, 
For me, it's like I, I'm also able to see. I think being older too, I see that it's bullshit. I see that yeah. people turn on you in a second. These famous people, <laughs> bless their hearts. That girl, you get a scandal, like. They will switch. Hey, I, listen, I seen it on even just the independent media circuit, okay? People will switch up. On, hey, listen, <laughs> they will switch up. You will hear so, a PSA from your boys. <laughs> so it's like just for me, that's how I, that's what I'm talking about in terms, in terms of my yeah. ego, that I should be in this space and I shouldn't be in, should be in that space and I should be hobnobbing with this person. And at the end of the day, I'm not owed anything. I'm not yeah. old, you know, when I, um, and I, I hope he, he's cool with me saying this, when I, my, my documentary Disclosure, streaming on Netflix right now, um, when we weren't shortlisted for, for an Oscar and we had done this yeah. big campaign and my, my director was just, he was, he was pissed and he worked so hard on this and for years of his life and um, he was so upset and I was just like, nobody owes us an Oscar. Like nobody yeah. owes us a shortlist. You know, I'm proud, the work, has to be the reward yeah. you know nobody owes me anything you know like yeah. it's just there is a there's a justice thing right and then like that, there's that piece and it's like okay no one owes me anything but then like what does justice look like you know yeah. what do reparations look like that that's a systemic thing right so i yeah. so yes people are owed things systemically right i think people are owed health care and people are owed you know a living wage and i think yeah. all that yeah and we need unions and yeah. so yes systemically people are owed some shit but like yeah. an end of like an oscar or an emmy or being invited to a party a friend of mine was like you know upset because we were at the vanity fair party Party and like I was going to the gold party, Beyonce and Jay Z's yeah. party, and she didn't get her. She was she went the previous year and didn't have her invite, and I was just like, I just know I would be like, and I, I live for Beyonce. I like I'm if I didn't get that invite, I don't feel entitled to the invite to her party. Yeah. I live yeah. for her. I would have I would have just taken my black ass home and just yeah. I would have been like stressing out about not getting the invite. I'm just it's like yeah. it's not that serious. I I see it a lot, even on, and it's funny. I see that a lot, like egos, even on just like regular content creators, not famous, not this. And I think you know, as much as I hate my experience as an immigrant in this country, I'm so grateful for what that has made me and how I see the world. But like, I am from an island that is 21 by seven miles long. Like mm. my Grammy, my family, I I remember having to convince my parents to let me come to America, and they were not. My daddy was in jacking it. No one thought my family, everybody, nobody thought I would. I can't even believe I'm my still being an America is a miracle. My being a lawyer is a miracle, all these different things. And I walk around, I remember myself how blessed I am. Like I live in a neighborhood where I live in a black neighborhood in New York where they over police. And I'll even think I'll walk around acting like the Avenger and getting people out of dynamics. And I think to myself, you know what kind of privilege that is? You're not from here. You could be in this neighborhood that you a lawyer. And so you, the people that look like you are treated with such a disregard and rights violated that you even have the ability to step in with your privilege to help somebody get what they should just be getting. And I, so I think about all those things and I'm like, you know what? The people that I read from, I am, I'm not a revolutionary. I see myself as a harm reductionist and a black person just doing my part. And I'm reminded that everything that I learn, everything that I espouse, somebody died to say it before. Somebody's a political prisoner somewhere. Somebody is not getting a post a cat being cute on Twitter and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I, I keep that with me every single day. And I'm like, you know what? Just the fact that you could say it, that it could help anybody because you don't you don't get to see all the people that you impact or how mm -hmm. somebody, you know, it changes somebody's mindset. Like, you didn't know me before. You didn't. When you reached out to me and I was like, Laver, I, I am a big fan. So you don't even know all the people that you're touching. And so yeah. I try to remember that that's the big blessing in it. And I do want to say that. one other thing, too. I really appreciate it because I'm a huge fan of Cornell West and, I, you know, yeah. not uncritically. But a huge yeah. fan, and he's been a huge inspiration. I just is what love looks like in public, just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. Is a quote of like yeah. that's, that's my shit, and so much of his other work. And I loved the way that you approached that conversation with with respect and with reverence. Let's talk about it. Let's be critical. And I think he would even, you know, say that yeah. he is not, you know, above being critiqued. I remember a yeah. conversation he had with Bell Hooks um, in the 90s, um, um, right after the uh, Million Man March that he participated in. And mm -hmm. she, she and I love Bell Hooks. May she rest in peace. Oh, I could. Anyway. I, um, I love her so much. I'm so glad I got to know her. Anyway. Whew. 
she was she was saying in the talk she was just like i'm i'm so happy to see you cornell but it's hard for me because i don't agree with you right now in public i don't agree yeah. with you right now and i don't agree with what's going on but i still have love with you but I, for you but i we need to be able to talk about what's going on here you know yeah. she was like she and i when i and i um the day she she hadn't passed yet the day i interviewed um cornell west from my podcast i called her and i said i'm interviewing um uh, brother west later today you know do you want me to ask him anything or say anything to him and she said she said i love bell hook she said tell him i still love him even though he don't treat me right <laughs> and, and then she said and then she said like and this is um she hadn't been um well for a while um she had been struggling with her health and she said even in that moment that like I really want him to like, I don't think he's really inter fully interrogated his relationship to patriarchy. That that's yeah. the key, just he hasn't really done that. And I, and I, and I, and I ask him about that. And what's, and so even, even in these moments when she was, um, when she was struggling and, and, and wasn't yeah. going to be on the earth that much longer, she, this was the thing that she had to get out. This is yeah. the thing that she had to say to this person that she's loved, that lo deeply loves for over 30 plus years. Let's talk about patriarchy. What is your relationship to patriarchy? Have you really in interrogated it and gone there? Yeah. And I just, um, I love her so much. And it's such a... Um, and she said, and she was so criticized. We have an episode of the um, um, podcast that we um, dedicate to Belle. She was so criticized, right? And people have issues, yeah. a lot of issues with Belle. Um, and I don't, I don't love Belle Hooks uncritically either, but I love her. I love, I love her Hooks. so much. And she changed my life. And that woman, oh, that woman. Um, and she was so kind and loving and generous to me. Um, but th that she was in that state and she was, that's what she had to say. Um, that's my bitch. That's like, that's what it's all about. <laughs> that's about to be the last word of this, of, of this interview. That's my bitch, Lauren. I love that. Yeah. Thank you, Liberad. And the minute you said yes, you could do it in June, I said, nobody comes on. There will be nobody uh -huh. interviewed until I could interview you first. And June 1st, girl, you were like, you had the email out. Yes. I was literally just leaving Savannah. <laughs> Just finished the show. Literally. You were on it, and you just you did my podcast, which hasn't come out yet. And I just live for you. I live for you. I congrats on the new cha um, YouTube channel. I've been watching. 